Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everybody. My name is Jim Duffy, and I'm the Director of Business Development here at Code, be it Code Consulting, Code Training, Code Staffing, and of course, Code Magazine. Who I am really isn't all that important compared to you, our awesome audience, for today's webinar. Scanning through the registered attendees list, I see some of our current software development clients, Code Magazine subscribers, and maybe even a few D and E list celebrities. I also see a ton of new names as well, so welcome everyone, and thank you all for joining us. As a thanks for attending, we're going to be setting up free Code Magazine digital subscriptions for all registered attendees, if you're not already a subscriber. Please allow me to introduce our presenter for today, Marcus Egger. For those of you who have attended our previous webinars, you're quite familiar with Marcus. For you first-timers, Marcus is the big fish around here. President and Chief Software Architect, Publisher of Code Magazine, International Author and Speaker, Microsoft Regional Director, and so on. He's also my boss, so I have to say nice things about him. He's a skilled windsurfer, an awesome golfer, and can leap large software bugs in a single bound. I'm told Marcus is making some last-minute streaming adjustments and will be ready to go in just a moment. We here at Code pride ourselves on helping people build better software. We build turnkey custom applications for some clients and convert and modernize legacy applications for others. We can help you with whatever platform you're targeting, whether it's a web application, mobile app, or a Windows desktop application. We can help with cloud-based solutions and your on-prem solutions as well. Got a question? Not sure what technology or platform to use for your next project? We're happy to spend an hour or so on the phone with you, being your expert friend in the software development field. No charge, no strings, no commitment, and no credit card required. Just free help from our code experts. Of course, we would love for you to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. We're always on the hunt for talent to join our software development teams or to write for the magazine. Check out these links if you're interested. And if you need additional developers to fill out your development team, click on the staffing link. We can help there as well. Finally, we would like your feedback about this webinar, and we're willing to put up 100 bucks for one lucky attendee. The survey is a very short 10 questions, and you'll finish that in no time. Make sure you get yours filled out by Friday night, though, to be entered. Okay, enough of my chit-chatting. It's time to get started with why we're all here. I'm told Marcus is ready to go, so I'll turn things over to him. Take it away, Marcus. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, that's some very kind words, although I'm not totally sure after last weekend's golf tournament what I even want to call myself a developer still. But anyway, uh, let's get started here. We have a lot to talk about today. Uh, let me go and switch over to my slide deck as well. Um, today we have a topic uh, that's a little bit unusual compared to what we normally do. Uh, today we're going to talk about AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services. Now this is still a state.net event, so we're going to talk about this a little bit from a Microsoft developer's point of view, although a lot of the things uh, you could totally uh, follow if you're not a Microsoft developer, but we'll draw a little bit of a comparison to some of the Microsoft technologies that you probably already know, in particular things uh, that you'll find in Azure, which uh, I know a lot of the people in this audience already know. So we're gonna take a 30,000 foot overview of what's going on in AWS, Amazon Web Services. We'll talk about some features every developer should know. We'll have, especially in the second part of this presentation, a lot of development examples. And uh, again, this is a high level overview. It's a huge topic. It's comparable in that sense to uh, the talk we did about Azure not too long ago that you can still find online at stateof.net.com. Um, and that means for a topic this big, we can only scratch the surface, but we hope to give you an introduction and of course, as always, we are here to help you. Consider us a resource. Uh, you can send us a question. We're not the kind of company that's gonna charge you for a quick email answer. Um, so, you know, that's that. Now for today's topic, I'm the first to admit uh, that I'm not the one that spends most of his time right in AWS. I do some AWS development, but there's certainly a lot of people within EPS and code that know a lot more about AWS than I do. Therefore, I got a partner in crime today. I got Philip, 
who is helping us both live as well as with some of the things that he has recorded. Uh, he is one of our AWS go-to guys and not the only one at that, of course, but uh, he's the one who is helping us out with some demos today. And so thank you very much, Philip. Uh, that is awesome. And you can reach him at that email address that's there. And by the way, you don't have to write these things down. We'll make the slide deck available on the Stata.net site as well as the recording of this presentation. Okay, uh, so that's Philip. Uh, in addition, we actually have some help from our friends at Amazon. We have Marty here today. Uh, he is in the chat, I believe, and ready to answer some questions. And by the way, if you have questions throughout this talk, uh, I have somebody monitoring the chat channel. I'll, I'm trying to monitor it myself a little bit as well. So I'll try to answer your questions as we go. Uh, it's a little bit difficult over YouTube because there's an odd delay of about 20 to 30 seconds or so. So sometimes it's a little bit awkward, but um, uh, I have some people that are helping me out. So both or, or all three of us, myself, Philip, as well as Marty, are going to be able to answer some questions. So, so that's awesome. Thank you very much for Amazon for helping us out with this event. Now before I get started a little more uh, about the Stata.net online events. Uh, we've now done a number of these events. Uh, we're starting to get used to them. Uh, we have a little bit of a better setup as far as having a real code studio with green screen and better lighting and so on. So we're trying to improve our online event story. Um, we'll continue to do this. We've covered a number of topics now. We have some interesting topics coming up in the future. And in fact, next month's topic, which I'll have a slide about later, it's gonna happen August 26th. Uh, well, we're still debating what the topic should be. We're thinking about some things like Azure DevOps, we're talking about cognitive services, machine learning, AI, we're talking about Linux, um, a general ASP.NET, where are we at type of talk. So we're looking for some feedback let us know what you're most interested in and we'll announce uh, the topic based on that, based on the survey that Jim mentioned earlier. Uh, so that's our plan there. So please provide some feedback on that. And uh, also, by the way, we are still planning to continue live events as soon as that's possible. Obviously, that'll probably be a little while before we can have events in various cities again, but that is on the drawing board. We, we will do that again, but we will keep doing these live events. We've gotten a lot of great feedback on the live version as well as the fact that people can watch the recording later. So we're certainly gonna be uh, looking to keep doing that as well. Okay, that's uh, it for the housekeeping. And let's dive into the topic at hand here. We are talking about AWS today. You already know that, otherwise you wouldn't be here. You probably know that that's Amazon's cloud offering. Very, very impressive, large cloud offering. Amazon is the leading cloud provider, of course, ahead of uh, Microsoft Azure. I generally say, I think of AWS as, as one of the two general purpose clouds that we use. Uh, of course, there's others, Alibaba and so on. But for our daily development, there are two big clouds we use all the time, and that is AWS and, and also Azure. Everything else, I tend to think a little bit more in terms of a specialty use, like we also use the Google Cloud, but that's usually when we need special services they offer, like mapping being one of the, the big ones that a lot of customers want to use. But when it comes to just general cloud, what do we deploy to? It's usually a choice between Azure and AWS. And in fact, very often, we use both of them together. We may use one service from one and another service from the other, and, and that works really well. And, and so that's a little bit unusual when you really think about where we are coming from. I mean, you're in an event that's called the state of .NET event, so clearly an event that has a Microsoft background. But in this day and age, as a Microsoft developer, AWS is just as valid a choice as Azure is. And a, a developer should probably know both is the way we are looking at it. And there's a reason AWS is the leader in the cloud space. So, you know, they're doing a lot of things right. And I can share with you based on our position in the industry where, you know, we are consultants, we are trainers, we are a magazine, we do a lot of events. We get a lot of feedback from a lot of people. Uh, and the feedback I'm getting about AWS is that the AWS customers are very, very happy with the choice they're making, as are the Azure customers, of course, but I, you know, from, from our point of view, I think it's 
the slightly more unusual statement to make is that AWS is something you should consider. Um, and a lot of other customers do. There's a lot of very high profile customers that are on AWS, Netflix, for instance, Airbnb, the government. And there's an interesting website. You see that the link that I have there at the bottom. Again, you can download these slide decks um, where you can look at who all the different customers are. And there's a lot of case studies and, and I find that to be a very interesting uh, link that you can look at to learn more about who is using AWS. Uh, so that's it from a, from a very, very high level view. Certainly something you should consider as a .NET developer, certainly something you should have just tried out at some point and you probably won't regret that. Now in terms of the scale of this whole thing, uh, we can look at how AWS developed. AWS started I think a good four years before Microsoft really officially got into the cloud business and AWS started in the first five years with four different regions and since then that of course has grown greatly uh, so in the next five years another seven regions were added and in, uh, in the recent years uh, another 13 regions were added and so um, this is growing uh, slides like this are always outdated I have the same problem when I do an Azure presentation both of these clouds are, are growing very, very rapidly. Uh, I have another slide here that gives you an idea of what's going on there. So three more regions are announced. Uh, a region is not a data center. A region is a geographic region in which multiple uh, data centers exist or, or to be more accurate, multiple availability zones exist. Uh, so Amazon has 24 regions, 76 or maybe not 77 availability zones. And within those availability zones, there's again multiple data centers to get to an ideal size that's very manageable, uh, that's also very environmentally conscientious. So um, very, very large in scale. I don't even want to go into the specific details that are going on there. And you can read up on all of that on uh, the AWS website. But the take home here is this is absolutely massive in scale. And Microsoft and Amazon, and Amazon even more so than Microsoft, are putting up huge efforts that are really not matched by anyone else in the industry, which is why we think uh, those are the two big ones and, and certainly AWS being a, a very, very valid choice. Now we could now dig into what are all the things they're doing with laying network cables and and load balancing and so on. Uh, we don't have the time in this talk, but I encourage you to dig a little bit on the AWS website because it is amazing uh, how big and interesting this thing really is. Uh, what I do find worth mentioning that always stands out to me when I look at AWS or when I watch an AWS uh, online presentation or, or go to an AWS conference, that sort of stuff, is how much Amazon focuses on custom hardware, creating custom uh, silicon, creating custom servers, creating custom storage options, load balancers, routers, all that sort of stuff is very, very big and on the forefront. Now, of course, Microsoft's doing a lot of that stuff too, but it always strikes me how much Amazon is doing and how big their effort is in terms of creating these custom hardware solutions. So again, something very interesting. I encourage you to dig deeper I wanted to mention it in this talk because I think it's a very, very interesting aspect of what they're doing. Now, in terms of why customers choose AWS, you know, there's lots of different slides I could have put up here. Obviously, tons of Fortune 500 companies, tons of governments are using AWS. AWS uh, and Amazon in general has a lot of experience running cloud operations, probably more so than anyone else. Now, of course, Amazon, just like Microsoft, had a lot of experience running large-scale data and, and web operations and infrastructure operations even before it became public. So I think needless to say, Amazon has a lot of credibility in terms of running large data and uh, data centers and cloud operations. And so you can't go wrong by choosing them. Like I said before, the scale of this is, is just unbelievable and it goes into things like physical security, um, 
it is really something that you cannot match with a, with a smaller provider or a smaller data center. That's about all I want to say about that. I think I've talked a lot about that already. I also want to bring up uh, the Gartner Magic Quadrant. Uh, this is a chart from 2019, about a year ago, but it hasn't really changed much. Maybe, maybe some of the dots moved slightly more to the right and up, but roughly we find ourselves at the same point there. And that shows among the cloud players how much are they visionaries and how much of the vision have they been able to implement and execute. Uh, and, and in th simple terms, you can think of this as how big, how feature complete, how feature rich, how uh, reliable and scalable is a cloud. That's the simple way of thinking about this particular chart. And certainly the quadrant in the top right side of uh, the square is where you want to be and the further you can be towards the top and, and the right, the better. And so clearly Amazon Web Services is the leader there, closely followed by Microsoft. And then Google is already falling quite a bit further behind and then there's all the other clouds are falling down more towards the bottom left and you almost kind of feel a little bit sorry for poor IBM lagging behind there. But, but the takeaway here is AWS is a great choice Microsoft is a close second, but AWS is really quite a bit up front. And I have another example here from the, from the fourth quarter of 2019, so fairly recent as far as market research goes. Uh, and you can see the relative size of these clouds. AWS is taking by itself about a third of the cloud market share and the cloud dollars. And, and they're growing at a very, very rapid pace. Microsoft is a distant second, and that chart, Microsoft's growing fast, but AWS is still very, very far ahead. And then, as you can see, there's a massive drop off even from Microsoft, but especially from AWS towards other clouds like Google, like Alibaba. And then we're already getting to the bucket that sums up everyone else. So key takeaway there, AWS is a great choice. Uh, nobody's going to blame you for picking AWS. It's a great choice. As a Microsoft developer, it's a great place to run Windows and .NET code, uh, Microsoft style databases, but of course it's a great place to run all kinds of other technologies as well. And that's really true for most clouds these days. It's they're not a single technology cloud. You probably feel right at home with a lot of the different things you're running. Okay. Um, quick note, side note here. Um, as we all know, we are in the coronavirus crisis that has, from our point of view, looking at our consulting customers and custom software customer, customers, led to another push of adoption of the cloud. Um, so we're seeing another, another big wave there, whether that's the second or third wave of cloud adoption, I guess, depends on your viewpoint. But we certainly see that this is very, very interesting for a lot of people at this point. A lot of companies that took a wait and see approach are now coming to us and are looking uh, to how they can actually move their current infrastructure to the cloud. And I can't go into too much detail here today. Maybe we'll do a state.net in the future about moving to the cloud, to any cloud, basically, a generic topic. But if you have any questions about that, how does this apply to your specific situation? Again, feel free to use us as a resource. We're not going to charge you for that immediately, uh, like a lot of other companies uh, would. Also, Jim mentioned it in his intro. Uh, if you came to this event, you're entitled to a free hour of consulting where we can discuss a very specific situation. And we already talked about that. Any language, any operating system goes on AWS, uh, just like Azure, any stack. Um, so don't think just because this is from uh, Amazon that this is not for you because you're a Microsoft developer. You will feel at home on this platform. So that's the general overview. Uh, that is probably of interest to anyone, even if you're not a, a developer. But now we're going to dive a bit more into uh, AWS specific for developers. And I already see there's some questions online. I'll be answering those in a moment. Uh, but let's just uh, finish our overview here. So from 30,000 feet, uh, looking at what AWS is, you see it's a lot of things, right? Now, if you've been to my Azure talk before, this seems familiar. It's, this is a very, very feature-rich cloud environment. 
And I put this up as a slide here and you can dig through that at home or you can just go to the AWS website and take a look at it there. The key takeaway there is there's a lot of stuff for you as a developer. You probably will never get to a point where you really dig into every single one of those things. Now, in terms of a starting point for a developer, the most interesting is probably the compute part. That's where we have things like EC2, LightSail, Lambdas, Elastic Beanstalk. Those are all ways to run your code. So for instance, if you want to run a website, you would probably deploy it to Elastic Beanstalk or do Lambdas or something like that. And uh, we'll get into some examples of that here in just a moment. So this is, if you come from the Azure side, uh, to, to draw the .NET Microsoft comparison, this would be uh, like um, a, a static website. This would be like an app service. This would be like Azure Functions, that type of stuff. Um, then we have storage. That could be anything from just simple file storage, blob storage, um, and storage environments that you need for other things. So that's also probably something that every developer should be familiar with. And I have a little bit more of a detailed slide about that as well. Um, then databases. Of course, it's very important to run databases. And that's one of the areas where most people immediately come to me and say, oh, well, but I'm a Microsoft developer. I use SQL Server. And now what would I do on AWS? Well, the simple answer is run a SQL Server on AWS because that's also available. But there's other options as well. There's uh, no SQL databases. Uh, uh, various things, uh, anything from things like MongoDB to running Oracle, all kinds of stuff that you can do on AWS. And so really you should think of this very, very similar to what you have on Azure if you're familiar with that. Now in Azure, you may have some specific things like DocumentDB that are Azure specific, but then the same is true for AWS. There's AWS specific database services as well. Uh, but in the big picture, unless you do something very specific, you can probably even move between the two environments reasonably well. Okay, So you should feel at home there as well. Uh, then there's uh, things that are getting more specialized, like content delivery. Uh, Amazon has a, an amazingly large and sophisticated network for content delivery. Uh, there's API management things and so on and so forth. Uh, then there's more specific, more, so we call it niche things that are provided like satellite communication through AWS Ground Station. Now I'm just managing this here because it's something that you wouldn't necessarily think of immediately. And then you get into very interesting things like machine learning and, and AI and uh, all those types of things that are beyond the talk here today, but I'm just highlighting this so you get an idea of the similarities and, and differences between the different clouds, because this of course is something that from a .NET point of view, we're also talking a lot and then this might even be next month's state of .NET event. Security of course is super important. Uh, there's various security features, as you can see, this is a very, very big group uh, from various uh, types of sign on to other security related services. So I'm just highlighting a few of those here. The point is there's a few that are important. Uh, that are key things that every developer should know, the compute, the storage, the databases. Uh, those are the big three and we'll talk about those some more. But then there's tons and tons of other stuff. So don't think of AWS as, oh, this is just a place to run my website because that's the surface we can scratch in this event here today. But there's a ton of other stuff and very, very interesting uh, to look into. And, and like I said, sometimes we combine clouds and use something that's really good in Azure in combination with an app that mainly runs on AWS and vice versa. And that works uh, well too. So that's the 30,000 foot overview. Let's talk about some of those main items there. First of all, compute. There's the Elastic Cloud, which provides, well, essentially computing services, a way to run stuff, to, to host your software. Now think of this, in a way that's comparable to various types of VM and hosted offerings on Azure. So you could absolutely spin up a, a VM essentially and just run your .NET code on that, okay? Um, but then as you get through this list without going into all of them, uh, there's various other ways of running your code. For instance, one of the things that we will look at in detail today 
is lambdas. Um, lambdas are ways to run snippets of code in response to various events, like for instance, an HTTP request. So if you now think, oh, I could run my website like that, yeah, probably you could, right? Or you could do something that responds to an inquiry that's coming in over uh, an SMS text message, or you could do something that's scheduled on a timer and, and just various other things, database events and so on. So we'll talk about lambdas in, in quite a bit more detail as the time goes on here. It's batch processing company capabilities. Also very interesting is Elastic Beanstalk. Elastic Beanstalk is probably most comparable to app services in Azure, right? So if you are building a .NET Core app, for instance, or any other kind of web app that does server-side processing, maybe Elastic Beanstalk is a good way for you to go. And I'll show you an example of that here in just a moment. Um, databases, uh, again, we'll see some examples there. Uh, there's RDS, Relational Database Service, so that's a really cost-efficient way uh, to run a structured database in AWS. But then there's also other options like uh, DynamoDB, DocumentDB, um, and so on, that are just different ways of running data, like uh, Elastic Cache is a you know, way to have a distributed caching environment, or you have ways to do essentially key value stores in, in a globally scaled way and so on. So we'll, we'll talk about that in more detail. And then there's the storage and, and storage is pretty much what it sounds like. It's the way to store blobs. And the most typical thing people use there is S3, simple storage service. That allows you to store any kind of blob, any kind of file uh, into the AWS cloud, similar to blob storage in Azure. And then a Specialized version of that, I guess, would be S3 Glacier, which is cold storage. And Azure, we call it cold storage or cold blob storage. It's a, a low cost way to store lots of data that's maybe not accessed as frequently. So from our point of view as a magazine publisher, for instance, of course, we have to run a lot of infrastructure on the magazine side of our business where we create files that go to print and they're very, very large in size and we keep them around forever but they're almost never accessed. We just wanna keep them for archive purposes and every now and then we go back. Something like Glacier is a really good way to store that because it's not something where latency or anything like that is a big problem. And it's a very inexpensive way to store uh, that kind of data. So, so those are kind of the most important um, type of blob storage services that are, that are available in Azure. Now a slightly different way of looking uh, or at AWS, I should say, excuse me, a slightly different way to looking at, uh, at looking at what every developer should know on AWS is this list of five things that especially from a .NET point of view, you should know. These are things that Marty uh, compiled in a blog post that sums it up very quick, uh, interestingly, with a lot of detail to, that goes with each of these things. But from a .NET developer's point of view, some of the questions that always get brought up is, first of all, if I build stuff in Azure, I get Visual Studio and I get all these amazing Azure features built in. Do I lose all of that if I move to AWS? And the answer is no, you don't lose that because in AWS, you can also use AWS tooling that you can download as an extension and install into Visual Studio. And with the AWS tooling, you really get a very similar experience to what you would get when you do Azure development. Uh, so that's interesting though, you don't lose that. Um, then it's interesting that there's a .NET SDK that covers all the services that are in AWS. And I even know how many, you know, well into the hundreds of services that are covered through uh, a .NET SDK. So it's very, very easy to code against all these specialty services in AWS, just like you would in Azure. So you, so you can see kind of a pattern emerge here. If the things that you expect from Azure, you usually also have in AWS. Uh, that includes being able to create infrastructure using the cloud development kit on the fly. Uh, another thing is people often think, well, I'm a C-sharp developer, I'm a .NET developer. Uh, on AWS, it's all these Linux guys using their weird languages. That's not true. As a C-sharp developer, you're just as much of a first-class citizen on AWS, and in particular uh, in Lambdas, which we'll take a, look, a close look at. Uh, and then of course, and you know, a lot of people already talked about that, the fact that there is a managed SQL service on AWS as well. So 
Those are interesting things to know. Now, as we get into the second part of the presentation here, um, let's dive into doing some actual development and look at some code samples. So this is where I get away a little bit from the slides and just run uh, a lot of code samples. So how do you get started with AWS? Well, first of all, you have to log into AWS and establish an account. And the way you do that is by going to aws.amazon.com. And, and there you can sign up for an account and then you can log in from there and, and use the console that they have. And, and again, this is the same conceptually as going to portal.azure.com if you're an Azure developer. You can come in here and this is the portal for AWS and then you can see all the different services that are here. So now you see where my slide with all the services came from, right? Because this is your one place where you can go to do all the AWS things that uh, that you need to do and in fact this was is updated on a regular basis and i find this to be uh, becoming more and more integrated and it's really not difficult as a net developer to find your way around in here uh, so that's how you get started you can then go and you can download the dev tools so as a net developer this is something that you should absolutely do. And the easiest way to get started with that is to go to aws.amazon.com slash net. So when you do that, you get to a page that provides all kinds of resources for a .NET developer. And I encourage you to look around here, lots of great information that you can get here that'll get you started as a .NET or an Azure developer in the, in the AWS world. The most important thing as far as our talk goes here is the AWS Toolkit for Visual Studio. You can download that uh, for Visual Studio 2017 and 19. You can also do it for older versions, but um, you know, you, you're best off having a recent version of Visual Studio. And then that installs all the tools. You can do the same thing through the AWS Marketplace, by the way. Okay, So, excuse me, through the uh, Visual Studio Extensions Marketplace. So that's a, a good thing to know there. And you know, you can get the same basically for Visual Studio Code and a few other things. So you can keep doing your development uh, the same way that you used to do it with uh, Azure, if you're familiar with that. And then you go on your way and you create a .NET web app. I've actually done that here. Let's go into Visual Studio. So here's my Visual Studio. And what I've done here is I've created a truly simple .NET Core web app. Uh, so this is uh, you know a Razor page app, and I've just created this using the default template. And that is something that I think a lot of people will do, where they either create something new based on their standard .NET development techniques, or they may already have an existing .NET app that they may want to push onto AWS, and that is most certainly possible. So I've just done this here. I created a very basic app. It's already running here, so we can go to it on my local host here. And this is just, you know, the default template. And uh, I don't think I'm actually running it, so let's go and run it. Um, .NET run. And so that just goes and launches my .NET Core application. And by the way, it doesn't have to be .NET Core. You could also do uh, other applications. So this will take a moment to start up here. There we go. Now let's try to refresh this. And here we go. Here's our plain vanilla ASP.NET Core web application running on .NET Core 3.1. Nothing special about this whatsoever. Now I could have gone into my new project dialog here. And because I have the AWS tools installed, we'll see that there's templates specific to AWS. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail here. Philip's gonna show us more about that in a moment. But that would be another way to go. I could go in here and look for AWS and see what it comes up with. And then you'll see that there is a fair number of AWS specific templates that we also got because we installed the AWS tools. So if I want to do something specific to Lambdas or AWS Lambda, then I could maybe start with that template. Okay, uh, but for, for me in this case, I just created a regular old 
uh, .NET web app, nothing special about it. So then my next step here is to publish this. And I have a new menu item here again because I installed the AWS tools here. I can say publish this to AWS Elastic Beanstalk. And when I do that, up pops a dialog similar to what we would see when we deploy to Azure. And this gives us all the options we have. And you see, I already did a few of these. Uh, and by the way, one of the things that tends to confuse me is I always get my regions mixed up. So if you do something in AWS and you can't seem to find it, make sure your region is right. Like when I created my first demo in prep for this talk, I was in the US. Now I happen to be in Europe, so it defaulted me into Frankfurt. And I was like, well, where is all my stuff gone? Uh, so just pay attention to, to that a little bit. That's to me one of the things that always confuses me. But anyway, I could now move through this process here and say, okay, well, what do I want to deploy? Maybe let's deploy a dev environment. And that creates a URL here uh, that this is going to be hosted on internally. Of course, you can then configure your AWS setup to have external URLs and so on, just like on all the other clouds. But uh, we're just going to go with that. And uh, it's not available. Let's make it two. And then we'll go ahead with that. And that's fine. I'm just gonna go with all the defaults here. The one thing that we're gonna get to that you need to pay a little bit of attention to is to make sure you have the right framework configured here. So in our case, it's a .NET Core 3.1 app. Um, and so make sure that that's the right thing. And then you go ahead with this and you can click deploy. And then it takes a little while. So I'm not gonna do this live right now, but I've already done it before I started my talk here today. Uh, then it just hit deploy and it deploys to AWS and it creates everything that you need. And uh, a few minutes later, you have your pre-deployed environment like this one here that I just did a few minutes ago. And again, it is our standard .NET Core app now running visible for the world um, in AWS. So if you are watching this live, you can now go to this URL if you are eagle-eyed and you would actually see that particular uh, application up and running. Now let's see what questions we have. Uh, we got a, a Lambda question. I'll leave that uh, to Philip because he's going into that later. Anyway, so, so that's the quick rundown of how you can build a .NET web app and run it in AWS. It's, it's really simple. It's, you know, you will, you will feel at home if you've done anything with any of the other clouds uh, like Azure. Right, so very, very familiar to .NET developers. Now, of course, I do want to stress this is just one way to go. You can use, you know, a lot of people build Node.js apps and who knows what else. And of course, they have supported just as well. Okay. Now, digging into the more interesting features, let's talk a little bit about AWS Lambda. AWS Lambda is server-side computing, uh, excuse me, serverless computing, and if you've been in the Azure talk, we already talked about that quite a bit. Serverless computing is huge. Uh, and it's also probably one of the worst chosen names in the history of software development, which is full of really badly chosen names. Because what serverless computing definitely isn't is computing without a server. Of course, there is a server there in the background. What it means is that you don't have to worry about the servers. In other words, you just want to deploy your software and you want your software to scale and replicate and do all the other things to run well. And you do not want to worry about how many servers are needed to do this, how the servers scale and so on and so forth. That is what we're talking about when we talk about serverless computing. And AWS Lambda is exactly that. Now, Philip will give you a lot of the details here, but the short version is that you are creating some kind of code, whether that is in C-sharp or in something else, but C Sharp is very well supported for this. And that code then responds to certain things. Now, a very common thing would be HTTP requests. Therefore, this can be used for things like APIs. This can be used even for things like web requests and showing it in a browser. But it can also be totally different events, things that happen in the database, uh, things that happen in a queue, things that happen on some kind of messaging service, like we received an inbound text message things that are scheduled. There's, there's lots and lots of different things that could happen that would trigger your code to run. And when you really think about this, 
a lot of software is something that responds to something happening, whether that's a user doing something or whether that's a scheduled thing that runs or, or some trigger that triggers something. Um, so that's AWS Lambdas. They've been around for a long time. Azure has something very similar. It's Azure Functions, also a very big topic there. Uh, but AWS Lambda is, is, is something that's been around for a while. And by the way, coincidentally, the current issue of Code Magazine, which you see the cover off here, uh, the cover topic, the biggest article in the issue, actually is about AWS Lambda development, in this case about API development. You can all get free access to that issue. I'm not trying to sell you something here. You can access this online on our website. Uh, you can actually also access it completely free of charge through one of our new mobile apps on iOS and Android, uh, where we are currently giving away all our content free of charge as kind of a special during the coronavirus crisis, as, as we know, a lot of people are stuck at home looking for things to learn and so on. So check that out. Uh, very, very good information available there. Now, with that said, I now want to hand it over to Philip because Philip has prepared a demo for us that goes into AWS Lambda. So, Philip, here you go. Thank you, Marcus. Hi, everyone. My name is Philip Bauer, and I'm a senior software developer at EPS. I will show you how to create a simple .NET Core application for AWS Lambda. To do that, we will use the AWS Toolkit for Visual Studio Marcus already told you about. The toolkit comes with templates that enable us to quickly deploy a functioning website. So let's dive in. Once we start up Visual Studio, we can create a new project and select the AWS serverless application project. In the next screen, we can give it a name. We will build a simple movie database today. So that's gonna be our project name. We can select a location on our computer to save it, and I will go with just the default. Next, we can select a blueprint for our application. Since this is going to be a website with server-side rendered templates, I will go with ASP.NET Core Web App. It comes with Razor Pages pre-configured that we can build upon. Once we click Finish, all the necessary files are created that we need for our application. This takes a moment. Once these files are created, we can go right ahead and test our application locally. After compiling, Visual Studio will open the browser of choice and display our website. Success! See, we can navigate. Everything works fine. Let's stop the debugging here. Our project comes with two entry points, one for Lambda and one for the local execution. This is important to note. We will get back to this later. For now, let's create a user in our AWS account that has the correct permissions to deploy our application to AWS. To do that, we'll go into our AWS account to the IAM console. Here, we click on Add User to create a user that we can use to publish the application. We will call this MovieDB Publisher. And this user will be a programmatic access type user. So this is not a user that you can use to log into this interface, but one that can use the CLI to deploy automatically. It comes with an access key and a secret access key that we will use to create a profile on our computer later. To find the right permissions is a task that is out of scope for this demonstration. For this one, we will own, just use an administrator access. I highly recommend though that in a production environment, you will create a user or a group 
that only has the permissions to create the exact uh, resources that you need for your application. I'll create our user. And here we are presented with our access key and our secret access key. We'll use these now to create a new profile in Visual Studio. In Visual Studio, we have the new AWS Explorer that comes with the AWS Toolkit. And here we can just create a new user. and give it a profile name. The credentials will be saved on your local disk, so make sure that no one has access to them. You can also use different methods like a .NET encrypted store. Let's copy the access key and the secret access key into this window. Press OK. And that's it. That's all we need to do to have a user that can deploy to AWS. To do the deployment, we right click on our project and we select Publish to AWS Lambda. Here we can, we can enter the correct stack name that we want. Uh, for us, that is MovieDB. This is for our cloud formation. And as a deployment bucket, we create a new S3 bucket that is called MovieDB Deployment. Now we're set and ready to publish. AWS Toolkit will now create the cloud formation template that is needed to create all the necessary resources in our AWS account. After this finishes, we will have a progress screen right here that will let us know when our publish is done. Now that our deployment is done, we can call our application right from Visual Studio. The AWS serverless URL is displayed right here. And with just these couple of, of clicks, we have our application deployed to AWS. Next. I will show you how to make this a little bit more useful by adding a database to it and access the data from that database and show it on your home page here. All right, Phil, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm actually gonna bounce this back to Philip here right away um, because the next step is to talk about uh, the databases and we're, we're kind of running out of time already, but. The quick version here is you have tons of different options on the databases and that includes SQL Server but it also includes many others and some of them are things where you can switch to AWS and, and, and others pretty easily like a lot of the NoSQL databases do have common interfaces so that's not very difficult to do and then of course every cloud also or, or both AWS and Amazon and, and Azure uh, also have uh, the individual database services that are specific to those clouds and then the moving will be a little more difficult. Uh, but without further ado, I'm just going to kick it back to Philip here and he's going to show us how he's going to add the database part uh, to his little application, example application. So Philip, here you go. Now that our application is deployed, let's add some functionality to it. We will attach a 
Microsoft SQL database to our project to display a list of movies on the home page. To do that, we'll go back to Visual Studio and create a new SQL server from within the AWS Toolkit. In the AWS Explorer, we will right-click on the Amazon RDS option and launch a new instance. Here, we will select a Microsoft SQL Server Express Edition for our demo. You can certainly also use any other edition of Microsoft Server. We will select the newest engine version and the T2 micro instance class that is eligible for the free tier. We'll give our instance an appropriate name, in our case, MovieDB. And we will create the master user credentials. Now we will select a new VPC. Uh, you can certainly select an existing VPC to deploy your server into uh, your, your existing VPC. But we don't have one in our AWS account at this point, so create new VPC is the option to go. We'll also create new subnet groups and make sure that the server is publicly accessible. This will add our IP address to the security group in the VPC. We can now click Finish to start the creation of our SQL server. While the server is deployed, we can overlook its creation right here in Visual Studio, we can go ahead and add the necessary code to our uh, application to connect to the database later on. To do that, we will select the Entity Framework Core uh, NuGet package and add that to our solution. Specifically, we will use the SQL Server package. To make sure that our code runs later, we will make use of a local database to test our application against. We'll start adding the movie database context for our entity framework first and add a model. Then we will add our service to the startup code and we will make sure that we have our local connection string accessible through our app settings. Let's begin by adding the movie database contacts in a new folder called data. We'll add that folder to our project called data. And then in there, we will add a new class called movie db context. I have this already prepared and we'll just copy and paste it. This references a new class that we haven't set up yet. It's called movie. Let's go ahead and add it to our project as well. We'll add a new folder in the data folder called models. And in there, we will add another class for all the movies.
our movie simply consists of an identifier and the movie's name. Next, we will add the necessary code into our startup uh, function to be able to call the context from within our template controller. To do that, we first add the necessary using statements using Microsoft Entity Framework Core. And for our context, we'll use MovieDB data. Now, in, in the configure services method, we will add our service. For our local environment, the connection string comes from our app, uh, app settings. Um, it will just get the get uh, the connection string right from in there. If we are in our Lambda environment, we will get our connection string from an environment variable that we later specify in the cloud formation template. Let's first take care of our configuration of our connection string in our app settings. For that, we will select the development app settings. And in there, we will add the connection strings. This will go against my local server to a database called MovieDB that I've already set up. In our template, we will add our context as well. I created this beforehand, so let me copy and paste it in here and then explain. In our model, I have a new attribute movie db context as a context for our template later i will expose the attribute movies and we add the context through our uh, constructor we can now simply go into the movies table and con and pull all the data and transfer transform it into a list Now let's modify our template so we can iterate over that list and display it. In here you can see I am using the MovieDB data again. And in our model, we'll have the movies specified that are then iterated over and out for each. If there are no movies, we'll just display that no movies were found save this. Let's take a quick look at the database that I've already set up. Right here in my local SQL server, I have the MovieDB database with a table called Movies. The columns reflect our model. And in here, I already have a couple of movies the best Christmas movies of my lifetime, for sure. We will use this script later to create the same in our SQL server uh, on AWS. Let's check if our code runs already. Great, I have the list of my favorite movies right here. All right, let's check if our database is up and running already. Okay, 
it's backing up. Let's take a look at the serverless template. This is where we have to add a couple of things to make sure that our AWS Lambda function can connect into the VPC that was created for the database or for the, for the SQL server. And then we will add the environment variable that we can use for the connection string. So to make sure that our Lambda has access to the VPC, it needs to create interfaces in our environment. That is what this new policy is for, the AWS Lambda VPC Access Execution Role. With this, it can create new network interfaces into the VPC. Our SQL server has its own virtual private cloud environment with its own subnets and security groups. The security group was uh, set up earlier when we went through that dialogue. Let's take a quick look and explore what security groups we have available in our um, AWS Explorer. To me, this looks like something might be missing. Let's check the status again in AWS. It seems like the backup process is interfering with the deployment of the um, information that we already have available here in Visual Studio. A little bit more patience and we could grab it from there, but Let's just go ahead and take the subnet IDs and the security group from here. So to add a new VPC configuration, we open a new object here, VPC config. And in the VPC config, we add subnet IDs. This is an array of strings, one string per subnet. That's our first. And we will go for two subnets to have better availability for our database. Now we have the security group ID. This also is an array of strings. Barring any typos, this will turn green. Okay, now we can go and take a look at our security group. And we can copy the security group ID from here. Let's paste it. And that's all we need to make the SQL server accessible uh, to our Lambda function. Now, one thing that applies to me, um, the inbound rule for my IP address is incorrect, uh, as my connection is a little bit weird. So in my case, I will just open it up to the whole internet because I know that I will uh, delete this resource very soon. I will also add another inbound rule to make sure that the MSSQL traffic can go from the, can be transported within the security group. Um, instead of connecting the AWS Lambda function via an IP, it will just use the security group as, as its conduit. All right, we'll save these rules. All right, and now let's take a look again at the database and see if we have a connection string that we can use uh, for the server part of our DB connection. Great, it's available now. Let's copy the endpoint. 
and in our environment variables, we'll set up a new string for the DB connection. Great. We now just have to replace the old server here with our new one. Let's copy this again. Paste it. And this should be good. Let's take a look now at what happens if we deploy this and the database doesn't exist yet. So we go ahead and publish this to AWS. By default, whenever we get an error on our deployed um, application, we will get a user-friendly error that does not expose too much information about the actual error that is happening in the background. And this also can be uh, controlled via the environment variables. Um, more on that. Uh, we can see later. So while this is running, I will prepare the connection uh, to the SQL server in AWS uh, to set it up in SSMS. We'll add a new connection. In our case, it's MovieDB, our endpoint here, the SQL Server authentication with login admin and password. We'll make sure that encrypt connection and trust server certificate is set and try to connect. Perfect. We have our connection up and running. Great, we only have our default RDS admin uh, database in here. And let's see what our deployment is doing. Still in progress. Let's see what's going on here. Maybe we're lucky and this is just lagging. Not, nope. Let's wait for this to finish. Hmm. All right, maybe you'd also just have to trust me on this. It will show you a nice error uh, instead of exposing your your actual errors and exceptions. Let's create a new database uh, with the with the movie DB name. Okay. Great. All right, let's refresh. Select our movie DB to create a new query and take our predefined table and data, set it up, check this out, we'll expect to see our movie table, give it a moment, it seems my internet connection is a little bit slow. I see. Okay. Well, let's try this again. Tables. Ah, awesome. All right, movies. We should have our. Oh, right click. Come on. Take. Uh, we have our movies, and in it we expect 
a handful of die-hard movies. SMS. SSMS is not friendly with me today. Please excuse that. Okay, here we have our script and we see our data is present. So now we would expect uh, when we call our published website that it shows us a list of diehard movies. Great, everything works as expected. Excellent. Well, thank you, Philip, for helping out with that. Um, I hope you got a good overview here of what AWS can do for you. Like I said, we can only scratch the surface. Perhaps in some future uh, State of .NET presentations, we'll go into more detail about many of these services. Uh, also expect us to publish more articles in Code Magazine. We'd love to hear some feedback on that, by the way. Uh, because we're also thinking about maybe even doing a special focus issue on AWS specifically together with our friends at Amazon. So let us know if that is of interest to you and we, we're definitely looking for some feedback there. Um, before we wrap this up, I'd like to make a few other announcements real quick. Uh, one of them again, please fill out this survey. We're really looking for some feedback there. We're giving away a $100 Amazon gift card it's usually not that many people filling out the survey, so uh, if you do it, you got a pretty good chance at winning that, and it really helps us out, so we would appreciate it. Again, we can only scratch the surface here, but if you have questions, if you wonder how this applies to your specific situation, we're more than happy to talk to you. Ping us, get an hour of free consulting, and if it's an hour and a half, uh, then that's fine too, and we won't charge you for that either, uh, so we can help you figure out how this really works and how this applies to your specific situation. I also want to draw your attention one more time to our new mobile apps that we have for iOS and Android. All our content going back to issue number one of Code Magazine is now available free of charge for anyone. All you need is some kind of subscription that's a technical thing. We're even giving away free subscriptions right now. So everybody can get free content, uh, access to all our content through our new mobile app. So take advantage of that. It's not just for the state of .NET people either. Share that with your friends. Uh, we're just trying to, to get the content to as many people as possible. Also, if you are a Microsoft customer and if you are in this particular presentation, and you probably are, Code Magazine is now free to all Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, Dev Essentials customers Microsoft has. Go to your Visual Studio site, formerly known as the MSDN site, claim your, Visual, your, your Code Magazine subscription. You can get a print publication completely free of charge, uh, courtesy of Microsoft, essentially. So check that out as well. Mark your calendars. The next Stata.net event is already on the screen. Uh, it's the 26th of August. Uh, we are still debating about the topic. Things that are on the drawing board are cognitive services, AI, and machine learning. Uh, other things uh, are ASP.NET development, the state of ASP.NET and, and web development on the Microsoft platform. Uh, there's a few other topics as well. Please fill out the survey. If you're very interesting, feel free to submit your own topics. Uh, the survey URL, by the way, is on the slides. We're also going to send out a follow-up email with it. Um, uh, so we can go back to that one more time for people who wanted to write it down. It's tinyurl.com slash aws for devs But we'll also send that out as a, as a follow-up email. But I saw there were some questions about it online. And that's really it. Thank you very much for attending. I hope you got something out of it. Contact us, uh, send us suggestions, share this online. It's nice to see that the code and Stata.net community is growing. Uh, it's nice to see that these online events are working out. This event today was somewhat special for us because not only 
are we streaming this to various locations around the world? But everybody involved in this was actually around the world too. While you know, I did my last two State of Net events from the U.S. I happen to be in Europe right now. Philip is in Austin. Ian, who you've communicated with online, is uh, in uh, headquarters in Houston. And Marty, I believe, is in London. So I, I, you know, it's a was an interesting setup for us, and it's a lot of fun to do these. And I hope you're enjoying it as much as, as we do. And feel free to, to share that. And thank you very much. Uh, and we'll be hanging around a little bit longer online to answer more questions. Thank you.